If you're a below normal VO2 max and you go just to normal, you're getting about a 2.1 increase in life expectancy. If you go below, below normal to high normal, which is about where half the population lies, then you're getting a almost three year increase in life expectancy. And then if you go to like more of an elite level, so you're getting into like above the upper limit, that's a five year increase in life expectancy compared to where you were when you were below normal. And so lactate is fueling that, your brain function during exercise, but it's also increasing things like norepinephrine, which is involved in focus and attention, serotonin, and there've been studies showing that even 10 minutes of a high intensity interval training workout can um, improve cognition, improve mood. I mean, it's just really easy to get those improvements in just a short amount of time by like, you know, just getting after it pretty hard. Hi, CrossFit. Um, yeah, so today we're gonna be talking about how to maximize your health span. And I'm gonna focus on three really important lifestyle behaviors. We're gonna talk about exercise. We're gonna talk about the, the strength of resistance training and the power of deliberate heat exposure. That's my disclosure. So um, focusing on exercise, it's gonna be really uh, vigorous exercise. We're gonna talk about the importance of vigorous intensity exercise going like 80% max heart rate or more. We're gonna talk about the brain benefits. We're gonna talk about cardiovascular benefits, um, cancer a little bit, exercise snacks. Then we're gonna get into some muscle biology a little bit, uh, the importance of protein, resistance training, and then into deliberate heat exposure and sauna and how that can synergize with both exercise and also with resistance training. So let's start with the vigorous exercise. So cardiorespiratory fitness is probably one of the most important biomarkers that we can measure via VO2 max, so maximal oxygen uptake during maximal exercise, that really indicates our fitness levels, right? But it also is a, probably one of the most important indicators of longevity. And there's been studies that have shown probably the most important, I would say, the maximal benefits you get from improving your cardiorespiratory fitness go from if you're below normal and you go anywhere above that. So if you're a below normal VO2 max and you go just to normal, you're getting about a 2.1 increase in life expectancy. If you go below, below normal to high normal, which is about where half the population lies, then you're getting a almost three year increase in life expectancy. And then if you go to like more of an elite level, so you're getting into like above the upper limit, that's a five year increase in life expectancy compared to where you were when you were below normal. Um, and about each unit increase in your VO2 max is associated with a 45 day increase in life expectancy. And there was a really important study published in JAMA journal, this was like in 2018, and there's now been a couple of papers since then. But I really liked this study because it really sort of showed that there wasn't an upper limit on the, the longevity benefit of improving your VO2 max. And so people that were in the elite group of VO2 max, so this is, we're talking like the top 2.1%. Those people had a 80% lower all-cause mortality compared to people that were in the lower 20% or so of VO2 max. If you were not the elite, but like just you still were really fit, you had a high VO2 max, you had great cardiorespiratory fitness, you still had a 20% increase in um, all-cause mortality compared to the elite athletes, like the people that had the really good VO2 max. So there seemed to really be a benefit at every level but what was so interesting about this study was that people in that low fitness group, they had a low VO2 max, their risk of death and all-cause mortality was similar to having diseases like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, it was similar to smoking. I mean, these things that everyone focuses on, these disease states that everyone focuses on, and we know they're bad, they, we know they decrease life quality, they decrease li lifespan, but what people don't focus on is how not having, not being physically fit, not having a good cardiorespiratory fitness is almost like having one of those diseases. And I really think that puts it into to perspective how important VO2 max is for longevity. So how do you improve your VO2 max? How do you improve your cardiorespiratory fitness? Well, aerobic exercise is definitely one of the best ways to do that. What type of aerobic exercise? I think it's pretty clear that high intensity interval training is one of the best ways to improve your VO2 max. And particularly when you do longer intervals, yes, you can improve your, your cardiorespiratory fitness with any type of 
uh, aerobic exercise, particularly if you're starting from being sedentary and then going up, right? But there was a really important study that was published, a large, large population of people that showed people that are doing moderate intensity, sort of zone two, like training, you know, this is the kind of exercise that is more enjoyable. You can go for a run and you can still have somewhat of a conversation, you're breathy. Um, those people are doing two and a half hours per week. They're meeting the guidelines and yet they couldn't improve their VO2 max, about 40% of those people. So you're talking like half the population here until they added in some high intensity interval training. And once they like, once they added in some high intensity interval training, they were able to improve their VO2 max. And so I really think that, again, this highlights the importance of really trying to get your heart rate up to, you know, at least 80% max heart rate or more. Um, the question is, well, what kind of protocols are best for improving VO2 max? I mentioned longer intervals. I think probably, you know, so Dr. Martin Gabala does a lot of this research at McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. And he has talked about, you know, one minute being sort of like probably the the bare, like the minimal effective dose for improving VO2 max, like at least getting in one, doing some one minute intervals and repeating that four or five times. But I would, I think one of the most evidence-based protocols, if you look in the literature out there for improving cardiorespiratory fitness is the Norwegian four by four protocol. And this is where you do four minutes of the most, in, you maintain the intensity that you can for that entire four minutes. So you don't want to like go out all out in the first minute. Do so you want to be able to like pace yourself? It's four minutes of, you know, high intensity exercise followed by three minutes of recovery. And you do that four times. So it's a pretty brutal workout, but it's the Norwegian four by four. And it's one of the best ways to improve cardiorespiratory fitness as measured by VO2 max. If you are interested in measuring your VO2 max, the best way to do it obviously would be directly to measure it, go to a lab that measures VO2 max. If you don't have access to one of those, you don't want to pay or whatever, um, there's there's a good evidence-based way of estimating VO2 max. And that's really the 12-minute run test or walk test, depending on your fitness level. And essentially, all you need is a wearable device that tracks your distance. And you run, you need a flat surface because uh, any, anything hilly will, obviously, you won't run as far because it's more challenging. So you need like a flat surface, like a track field, and you run for 12 minutes and you pace yourself. You wanna, you wanna go hard, but you wanna be able to like do it the entire time. Um, and then there's an equation you can look up, 12 minute run test equation, VO2 max, and it, it's, you know, the distance and this whole equation will give you a really good estimate of your VO2 max for anyone that's interested in sort of seeing how their training affects their, their VO2 max. But I think one of the most convincing studies that I've seen for vigorous intensity exercise has to do with structural changes in the aging heart. So as we age, our heart undergoes structural changes. It gets smaller in size and it gets stiffer. And this translates to functional um, you know, deficiencies like exercise capacity goes down, but also it increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. A lot of different changes start to happen in the cardiovascular system when that occurs. And so um, there was a study done at UT Southwest in Dallas by Ben Levine's group where they took 50 year olds that were, they were disease free, but they were sedentary, right? So they didn't have type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease, but they weren't physically active. And they put them on one or two, two different exercise protocols. One that was the control group, which was more like a stretching, a little bit of a body weight um, training. It wasn't high intensity. They weren't really getting the heart rate up a little more like yoga-ish type of workout. And the other group did that, but they also had a high intensity, like vigorous exercise workout program. And this was a two year intervention um, study. And so the first six months was like a progressive building up their, their, their endurance. And um, once they got to the six month part uh, mark, uh, most of these people were doing about four to five hours a week of training and a good portion of that time was spent in what's called maximal, um, your maximal state, exercise state, where they, they were doing like 20 to 30 minutes a day of maximal intensity exercise, not maximal intensity, but um, steady state. So they were able to basically maintain the maximal amount of intensity they could for 20 or 30 minutes. So it was, it was vigorous. They were going 75, 80% max, max heart rate. Um, they also did the Norwegian 4x4 protocol once a week. And after those two years, the structural changes in their heart reverted back 
almost 20 years. So this, the, their hearts got like more malleable and they got larger. And it was like looking at a 30 year old heart. And these were 50 year olds. And so, I mean, to me, it was just so astounding that you could get structural changes in the heart, re essentially is reversing the aging heart by just about 20 years from doing this vigorous intensity exercise protocol in 50 year olds that were sedentary. And there's also drug size blood pressure improvements in um, with blood pressure with vigorous intensity exercise. So there's been a variety of randomized controlled trials and meta analyses of these trials that have found people that work out and do more vigorous intensity exercise three to four days a week, uh, about 20 to 60 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise can improve their blood pressure similar to medications like anti-hypertensive medications. And blood pressure is not, high blood pressure is not just um, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's now been established that it's one of the most important early risk factors for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So the fact that you can comparably get these improvements in blood pressure um, like you would get with a pharmaceutical drug is also, I think, extremely encouraging, right? So I want to shift gears just for a minute and get into um, some of the brain benefits. I think probably one of the most convincing reasons to get your heart rate up high, when I say high, I mean 75, 80% max heart rate, to do that is from be brain benefits. And that largely has to do with something called lactate, which probably many of you are familiar with. So when you force your muscles to work so hard that they that you can't get oxygen to them fast enough to make energy, they're, they have to adapt, right? And they use glucose as energy without the mitochondria, which is generally how you're making energy. And as a byproduct of that, you're, make, you're, you're churning out lactate, which was thought to be this sort of metabolic byproduct. Um, it turns out it's much more than that. And so lactate gets into circulation and it's taken up by other tissues, including the muscle, the brain, the heart, liver, and it's used as energy in those tissues. So it's a very energetically favorable source of energy. It's actually easier to make energy from lactate than from glucose. So it takes less energy to make energy from lactate and glucose, but also it acts as a signaling molecule. It's a way for your, mus your muscles to communicate with other parts of your body um, because, you know, when you're exercising, it is a stress on the body. And so adaptations happen, right? When you're, when you're working your muscles hard, you can, you know, increase muscle hypertrophy. Um, these adaptations happen, cardiovascular improvements, you're getting increases in stroke volume cardiorespiratory fitness improvements. Well, the brain also works really hard during exercise. And so lactate is communicating with the brain. Um, and there's many benefits to having lactate go into the brain. And one of those is that it signals to the brain to make something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And what this is, is a growth factor that is involved in increasing new neurons inside the hippocampus. Um, and other regions in the brain, but most of the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory. Um, and there's been intervention studies showing that aerobic exercise after, you know, older adults that do it for two years increase their hippocampal volume by like 2%. So um, it increases neurogenesis, but it also is important for neuroplasticity. Um, this, is, this is the way your brain adapts and um, is able to adapt to the changing environment and still function. It plays a big role in um, depression. People that are depressed have a very uh, low level of neuroplasticity. And so they're, they have a hard time adapting to the changing environment and that causes uh, depressive symptoms. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor is like amazing for your brain. You want more of it and high intensity, you know, exercise is the way to get more of it. It also, lactate also signals to the brain to make neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and serotonin. These studies have been done in humans. Um, lactate, again, made from muscles. When you're forcing your muscles to work hard, when you're going high intensity, crosses over the blood-brain barrier and your brain is working hard during exercise. And so lactate is fueling that, your brain function during exercise, but it's also increasing things like norepinephrine, which is involved in focus and attention, serotonin. And there've been studies showing that even 10 minutes of a high intensity interval training workout can um, improve cognition, improve mood. I mean, it's just really easy to get those improvements in just a short amount of time by like, you know, just getting after it pretty hard. Some of the protocols that have shown improvements in uh, maximizing BND, BDNF um, really are intensity and duration dependent. So the harder you go, 80% max heart rate for 30 to 40 minutes is one of the most robust ways. There's also another really good protocol. So this would be six minutes of high intensity interval training 
where you do about 40 second all out intervals separated by some recovery periods that also has been shown to pretty robustly increase brain derived neurotrophic factor as well. So I just wanted to spend just a second talking about some of the anti metastatic effects of a vigorous intensity exercise. Most of us here know that exercise is one of the best things you can do to prevent cancer, but also as an adjunct cancer treatment. Many different ways that's occurring, but one interesting way that most people don't know about is through the shearing forces of your blood, just blood flow. So just getting that blood flow, flow to go faster by exercising, by getting that exercise, um, kills what are called circulating tumor cells. Um, these, are, these are tumor cells that have escaped a primary site of the tumor, get into circulation, and they go and you know, try to travel to other tissues and take camp there and you know, metastasize. Well, circulating tumor cells are very sensitive to the mechanical forces, the shearing forces of blood flow. And they can't, they can't handle the stress like our normal cells can, and they die. Um, and so that, I just think that's a really interesting way to think about it because it's so, it's like, oh yeah, I need to get my blood flow up. I need to, I need to get my heart rate going and my blood flow up. And that is something that has an anti metastatic effect. And there's studies that have shown, um, you know, obviously aerobic exercise and the higher the intensity of the exercise, uh, it can reduce the amount of circulating tumor cells in people with cancer, like colon cancer, circulating tumor cells in people with cancer, uh, is a, it's, it's, it's an indicator of bad outcomes. So they have a four times higher uh, mortality risk than people without them. And uh, people that engage in aerobic exercise have improved outcomes. They have better uh, reduction in disease recurrence and also in mortality. So I want to shift gears for a minute and talk about exercise snacks. So we're going to talk about improving metabolic health, but also longevity and exercise snacks it's kind of a broader term, but it really can refer to either a deliberate sort of type of exercise that you do for one minute, two minutes, three minutes. And this is anything from burpees to squats. Um, you can do high knees. You can do, you know, there's a variety of different things that you can do to, to get your heart rate up really high in a short period of time. And um, we're talking set at least 75% max heart rate. And there's studies showing that it re there's a real metabolic benefit to even doing a minute or two of, of this exercise snack type of exercise. And that, again, comes down to lactate. Lactate, you know, you're forcing your muscles to work really hard. Lactate gets into circulation, gets taken back up by the muscle, and it causes glucose transporters to come up to the muscle and sort of open the gate so that glucose can come in. And, um, you know, so this really improves blood glucose levels. And there's been a lot of studies looking at this, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes, doing exercise snacks around mealtime. So anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour before or after a meal can really dramatically d decrease the postprandial glucose response and, and improve blood glucose levels. Now, sure, that's important for people that are metabolically dysregulated, people with type 2 diabetes. But like, who doesn't want to improve their postprandial glucose response? I mean, that's part of what makes you feel sleepy and your, reduces mental clarity after a meal. So doing timing these exercise snacks around meals is a great is a great and sort of easy way to improve your blood glucose levels as well. And it's pretty easy to do. Um, the other way it improves metabolic health is these exercise snacks, when you're doing a high intensity, you know, interval training sort of thing, even one or two minutes, but mostly when you're going higher than that, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, it's a very potent stimulus to increase the number of mitochondria in your muscle tissue. Again, it's an adaptation. You are forcing your muscles to work so hard that they can't use their mitochondria because it's the, again, oxygen can't get there fast enough. And so they're forced to make energy another way. But your muscle is smart. It's like, oh, I need to like adapt so that the next time I'm working hard, I can use my mitochondria. And the way it adapts is by making new mitochondria. It's called mitochondrial biogenesis. And high intensity interval training is one of the best ways to increase mitochondrial biogenesis in skeletal muscle. Again, Lactate plays a role in that because lactate is that signaling molecule. It increases a protein called PGC1-alpha that regulates mitochondrial biogenesis. Exercise snacks have also been associated with improved longevity. So there's another type of exercise snack that's a little bit more of taking advantage of like everyday situations. It's called vigor vigorous intermittent lifestyle activity. And um, these, these types of exercises are like, let's say you, you work on the fourth floor of a, you know, some office building. So rather than just walking up the stairs every day, which is better than taking the elevator, you sprint. 
Or let's say you, you know, walk to your office. Well, rather than just walking, you interval walk or you, you sprint there. You, you do some sort of interval where you're getting your heart rate up. So there have been multiple studies showing that doing one to two minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. So people, these large studies, people are wearing wearable devices. And so um, researchers are getting their data, their heart rate data, and, and able to measure something and identify people that are getting their heart rate up, right? Um, and so people that do one to two minutes of vigorous intensity exercise a day, um, sorry, three times a day, had about a 40% reduction in all cause mortality. So that's dying from all like non-accidental causes of death and a 50% reduction in cardiovascular related mortality, which is like the number one killer in most developed nations. So this is, again, just one to two minutes, three times a day where you just, you're, you're doing those exercise snacks. It adds up, it's beneficial. Um, and, and clearly it's making an effect in, in people's lives. And, and these, are, it, these benefits were also found in people that identified themselves as non-exercisers. In other words, they don't like go to the gym. They're not, you know, they're not, they're not taking time to like deliberately engage in a sort of exercise routine and they still have these benefits. So how do you implement, you know, exercise snacks in your day? Why would you want to? Well, there's, there's, there's evidence out there that just being sedentary. So like right now we're all sedentary where you're, you're sitting where you guys are. I'm not, yeah, you're sitting, you're sitting in your, your chair. You've been in here for about what, an hour or so. Um, that is sedentary time when you're sitting at your desk, at your computer for six hours or whatever, fill in the blank time, even though you're going to go to the gym later, or maybe you went earlier, that time that you're sitting is sedentary. And being sedentary is an independent risk factor for cancer. Um, so there is reason to kind of break up your sedentary time with exercise snacks. And again, these would be like a deliberate sort of thing that you can do. So I think all you need to do is some high knees, right? <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So finding something that you're going to do consistently. That's, that's really important, right? I'm talking a lot about vigorous exercise, but it needs to be something that you're going to do consistently. Whatever it is, Norwegian 4x4, if, it's, if that's your thing, I definitely like, <laughs> you're, you're, all, you're amazing. Um, so, you know, the, the thing is to really just measure your heart rate, right? That's, that's the easiest thing. Uh, make, it, make it consistent. Do something you like. All right, we're going to shift gears just for a minute and talk a little bit about muscle preservation, the synergy of protein intake, lifting, resistance training, and heat exposure. Peak muscle mass happens around between the ages of 20 and 30. And then after that, you know, sorry, as you start to get in your 40s and 50s, you lose about 8% of muscle mass per decade. Once you get into your 70s, 15% of muscle mass per decade. So most people, by the time they're 70 or 80 years old, only have about 60 to 80% of the muscle mass they had when they were 30. Skeletal muscle is, it is a reservoir for amino acids. Um, so like our, we store, you know, we store glucose as glycogen in our liver and our muscle. We store fat as triglycerides. We don't really have a good way that we store amino acids, but we need amino acids every day. Amino acids make up proteins. And proteins are doing everything in our body from making neurotransmitters to making a heartbeat, you know, everything. So um, unfortunately, if you don't get those amino acids from protein, you're going to pull from that amazing reservoir, your muscle, your skeletal muscle. And so you really need to be constantly giving yourself protein to not do that. And so the question is, well, how much protein do you need to give yourself to not do that? And that's a pretty contentious, I would say, um, question that people have, you know, differing answers on. So the recommended daily allowance, the RDA, was, this is set by these committees and there's lots of things involved in that. But to simplify, um, about, you know, 40 years ago, this RDA was set and it was set to be 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And that was thought to be the amount that you needed to take in every day to not to minimize um, the amino acid losses from muscle, right? To replace all your amino acids, to be able to, to get enough protein, right? Well, it turns out, so studies that have been done by experts like Dr. Stuart Phillips at McMaster University uh, and others have shown, so the, the way that that RDA was 40 years ago uh, set was, it was flawed um, in terms of like the techniques that they used. They're called nitrogen balance studies. They underestimated the amino acid losses. 
And so here we are, 40 years later, scientists have more sensitive tools, we have a lot more at our disposal, and they're saying, no, actually we redid these studies, and we found it's more like 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight as the bare minimum to just basically be able to uh, not be pulling amino acids from our muscle, right? Um, and then that number goes up if you're physically active, um, it goes up to 1.6 grams per, like, per kilogram of body weight. And then there's a, you know the, the elite level, you can go up even further than that. But um, I think the, the bottom line here is that the RDA is too low and there's a lot of scientific consensus in, in terms of um, you know, people that are experts in that field that are saying, no, we need, to, we need to boost that up. And another problem with that is that the RDA 40 years ago, they did these nitrogen balance studies in young adults not older adults. And we know that older adults, again, this is data from Stu Phillips' lab, um, he's a real leader in this field, uh, that older adults experience something called anabolic resistance. So their skeletal muscle is not as sensitive to amino acids to make, so uh, to, to increase skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So, um, you know, he's done studies where he's found that actually older adults you can, they can um, prevent their atrophy by taking in 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight versus the RDA, which is 0.8. So all the more reason to increase that, you know, d that RDA to 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight. You know, obviously, the less muscle mass you lose, the less frail you're going to be. And those studies have also been done. The more muscle mass, less frail, less likely to, you know, fall and break something, fracture risk and all that. So important to imp improve and increase that um, RDA. Just as a quick aside, because we're talking about anabolic resistance, I just want to bring omega-3 in there. So Chris McGlory, he's at Queen's University, uh, trained with Stu Phillips, and when he was training with Stu, he found that high-dose omega-3, so anywhere between four to five grams, could basically blunt the disuse atrophy that occurs by like 50%. And this was in, this was in younger adults, not in older adults. But it's just really, it so there's been some, some subsequent studies since then. This is really a growing field. It's really in its infancy. But Chris and some other people believe that partly what's happening is omega-3s are sensitizing skeletal muscle to amino acids. So this is independent of its anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, and, and that's also, it's important to note here that the studies that they're doing, they preload people with high-dose omega-3 for about one month because it takes about one month for omega-3s to accumulate in cell membranes, including in cell, your, your skeletal muscle cell membranes. So that, I think, is also really an interesting thing. It's a growing field. Like I said, there have been meta-analyses looking at muscle mass in older adults taking omega-3 supplements. And if the doses are high enough, so at least two grams, so there's a meta-analysis of multiple randomized controlled trials, there is an improvement in muscle mass and also in some, there's some functional improvements as well. But the dose had to be at least two grams. For doses less than that, it, there was really no effect. Again, you'll find conflicting data in the literature, so it really depends on the protocol that's used. So we're talking about muscle mass, but strength actually fades faster with age. Reductions in muscle strength can happen. So in men, they start to lose three to four percent in strength. You know, as they get older, women are about 2.5 to 3 percent, and this can lead to functional issues, slow walking. You start to lose independence. You get increased, you know, fracture risk, frailty, and then all those things sort of add up to a you know higher risk of death. So resistance training is one of the best ways to not only increase muscle mass, but also muscle strength. And there have been a lot of meta-analyses of studies. So there's 21 different randomized controlled trials that were that were ana analyzed, and they found that older adults that engaged in resistance training one to three times a week for about eight to 18 weeks could recover strength that was basically lost over years of just being inactive. So in other words, just doing you know eight weeks of resistance training, one, one to three days, right? One to three days, they could recover losses in strength like from years of being inactive and sedentary. And, and strength is a lot easier for older adults to get, the, to get those gains. Um, they still can get gains in muscle mass as well, but, it, but the, the strength is something that's very encouraging as well because, you know, the, the functional decline is, is something that's very important. And so if they can gain those strength, get those strength gains back, it's also going to improve their quality of life and also um, reduce their mortality risk. 
So how much do you have to lift? Um, well, this is also very encouraging for older adults. Again, Stu Phillips pioneered these studies, first in untrained individuals, where he showed that people could lift lighter weights and get the same gains in muscle mass and strength as people lift, lifting heavier, uh, as long as the volume was like enough, as long as the effort was put in and there's, you know, they're, they're basically getting fatigued. Um, and then Brad Schoenfeld went on to show this also in trained people, so it wasn't just a newbie effect. And now it's, I think, becoming a little bit more clear that you don't have to lift heavy to get gains in muscle mass and muscle strength. You can lift lighter, but as long as you're putting in that effort and still get improvements in muscle mass and strength. And I think that has a lot of relevance for a broader population of people, not just people that are really, you know, the elite sort of bodybuilder type. We're talking our parents, right? Um, our grandparents, you know, maybe people like that don't really know how to do resistance training and don't want to injure themselves. So I, I think this has a lot of um, application and it's a really important thing to point out. Okay, for the last part of my talk, I just want to talk about deliberate heat exposure and how we're just going to focus on a couple parts of this. Um, we're going to talk about how I can synergize with what we've been talking about today, cardiorespiratory fitness, muscle mass. So in, engaging in deliberate heat exposure from something like a sauna or even hot tub, hot bath, there's a lot of physiological um, adaptations and effects that happen that are very similar to aerobic exercise. And those things are like increased heart rate. You're getting increased plasma volume. You're getting increased stroke volume. You are getting hot. Your core body temperature is elevating. So uh, you sweat to kind of cool yourself down. There's a lot of similarities between deliberate heat exposure from the sauna and more like moderate intensity exercise, I would say. Uh, your, your heart rate can go up to about 120 beats per minute. Some people can get it up a little bit higher, particularly if they go in right after a workout. But there's been head-to-head -head comparisons of moderate intensity exercise and sauna use. And it's really like the, the studies have shown they're pretty comparable. So like when you're doing the activity, heart rate goes up. Uh, your blood pressure goes up while you're doing the activity. But then after the activity, whether it's exercise or sauna, you're getting blood pressure improvements, your resting heart rate is improved, and so and these things are comparable. So really, in some way, I would say, do, engaging in deliberate heat exposure from the sauna is mimicking moderate intensity aerobic exercise. And there have been observational studies and some intervention studies we'll talk about in a second, but observational studies looking at people that are, and this is in Finland, where saunas are pretty ubiquitous and most people are using them, um, so people in Finland that have a sauna or using sauna and they exercise have a better cardiorespiratory fitness than people that exercise alone. We're talking about the you know, same volume of exercise. And these people, the ones that do that, but also sauna, had, it, had a better cardiorespiratory fitness than people that only engaged in exercise. And then there's been intervention studies by uh, Dr. Yari Laukinen that have shown, so he's taken, um, he's taken untrained people and put them on an exercise protocol. It, it was a stationary bike. And then he, he had two groups, one that just did the stationary bike with passive recovery and the other ones that did the stationary bike, but then they went right into the sauna for 15 minutes. And, and he looked at a variety of parameters, one of them being VO2 max. So what he found was that those people that did the, the exercise bike and the sauna had a better VO2 max than the ones that only did the exercise bike. And to me, that makes sense because, again, it's almost like extending the workout. You're, you're, you're extending it just a little bit more. Um, there were also better improvements in blood pressure and other lipid parameters as well in the group that also added a sauna plus the, the exercise. So I think there's benefits to deliberate heat exposure for people that are physically active, but also, you know, people that are not, people that are disabled, people that can't get on a bike, people that can't go for a run, people that can't do a burpee they can get into a sauna and get somewhat of that cardiovascular benefit. And there's all sorts of observational data out there looking at people that use the sauna um, four to seven times a week. They have a 50% lower cardiovascular related mortality, 40% lower all-cause mortality, and it, it goes on and on. So I think there's, there's a lot of uh, utility there for people that really just can't go and, and work out as well. So another really important adaptation that happens when you are engaging in deliberate heat exposure for something like the sauna, also a hot bath, is the increase in something called heat shock proteins. And these are pro this is an adaptive response. So as you're elevating your core body temperature, you're getting hotter. 
these heat shock proteins are activated and they are the main role that they the, the main function they serve is to prevent proteins from aggregating and forming plaques in your cardiovascular system in your brain um, in fact there's been multiple uh, you know animal studies showing that if you give a mouse you know like a amyloid beta plaque sort of what we we get in, with humans in Alzheimer's disease uh, and you express the heat shock proteins make them highly expressed that uh, they don't get the Alzheimer's like symptoms and it, it helps with the plaque uh, aggregates and stuff so heat, heat shock proteins play an important role in preventing protein aggregation they have somewhat of an antioxidant effect they're also very important for slowing muscle atrophy uh, and this is again it has to do with a variety of mechanisms. There's been a lot of animal studies on this, but there's now been some human data where people, you know, there's intervention trials where they're, you know, engage, they basically immobilized one of their limbs for a period of weeks and then did some local heat exposure. And the local heat exposure prevented the disuse atrophy by like 40%. So, um, you know, I think that's a very relative, again, a very relevant um, weight for people that are injured or again people that are older and they're experiencing a lot of muscle atrophy as well but there was also a very recent study and this is small so it needs to be repeated but people that were engaging in resistance training either just alone or then went into the sauna right after their resistance training they had greater gains in muscle mass if they went to the sauna right after the resistance training compared to resistance training. Well, they actually, it was biomarkers of it. So I, they didn't directly measure the muscle mass. It was biomarkers. Of it. But, but anyways, I think it's an encouraging and promising area that, of course, I'm excited about and glad people are out there researching. Um, but it's another possible possibility for um, a synergy between resistance training, between like, vigorous intensity exercise, your exercise program, and then engaging in deliberate heat exposure as well. So what are the parameters in a lot of these studies? Well, a lot of the parameters um, in many of these studies are coming out of Finland. The temperature is about 174 degrees Fahrenheit. And the duration spent in the sauna is about 20 minutes. And that's important because people that spent less than 20 minutes, like let's say they were in there for 11 minutes, they didn't have the robust effects. Uh, so it really is a, a temperature dependent, duration dependent, but also frequency. So how many times a week you know, people are getting in the sauna for anything to occur two times a week was like the minimum effective dose. So if people did something twice a week, it was more beneficial than once a week. But people that did four times a week, four to seven was really the, the most robust effects. So if you are looking for the most robust effect, the minimum time would be four times a week, you know, compared to, to one time a week. Um, the humidity is usually around 10 to 20%. And the question a lot of people ask is, well, what about, you know, what kind of sauna? What if you don't have a 175 degree sauna? What if you have an infrared sauna that goes up to 145? Like, is that, can you get comparable effects? Um, again, temperature, duration dependent, right? So you're not, you're not going to get the same effect in 20 minutes in a 145 degree sauna in terms of the heart rate and the cardiovascular adaptations as you're, as you're going to get in a 180 degree Fahrenheit sauna, right? So uh, you might have to stay in there twice as long. You might have to stay in there 45 minutes to an hour to start to get your heart rate up. Again, you can wear some kind of heart, you know, wearable heart rate measure uh, device where you're looking at your heart rate and you can feel it like when it starts to go up. Sometimes it'll take a long time in an infrared sauna. There are studies out there that have compared regular hot saunas to infrared in terms of cardiovascular benefits. And if the same volume of time is spent in there, you're not going to get as, as robust of an effect on blood pressure improvements as you would with a regular sauna. So again, you might have to spend more time in there as well. Hot baths have also been shown to increase some of these biomarkers like heat shock proteins that sauna has. And I really think that's a really a good, um, you know, the, the fact that it's able to increase some of the same biomarkers to me signals that maybe hot baths or any sort of modality that's really increasing your heart rate that's making you hot is something that's going to be beneficial as well. So I do think that people that don't have access to a sauna could do a hot bath, get one of those little uh, pool devices that measure temperature, put it in your bath and keep it up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit and be in there for 20 minutes because that's what the studies have shown. 20 minutes at 104, shoulders submerged all the way down. So that's it for today. Uh, three powerful habits that I think will help delay the aging process that will improve health span. We have vigorous intensity exercise, find a way to make it frequent, do those exercise snacks, they're so easy. Incorporate resistance training, protein intake, thinking about that protein intake is a lot of work. 
And then in deli- engaging in deliberate heat exposure, whichever way you like. I prefer to do it after a workout, but I also like to do it at night as well. So um, that's, that's, that's what I have for you today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take some questions for um, Ron, if anybody has one. There are lots of hands up. Right. Woohoo! Thank you. Um, I had a question about the omega-3s. You mentioned a minimum of two, optimal four to five. Is that total omega-3s or is that specific DHA or what omega-3s? Yes, so um, the question is like what type of omega-3 was involved in the disuse atrophy study coming out of Dr. Chris McLaurie's lab at um, Queens University. Uh, So it was the marine forms of omega-3, so it was EPA and DHA. I don't know off the top of my head the ratio, but they were pretty similar-ish. Um, if I were to interject my own thoughts here, I think a large part of it has to do with DHA, which is what's mostly accumulating in the cell membranes a lot more than EPA is. The EPA is a little bit accumulating in there, but DHA is heavily accumulating in many different cell membranes, including in, in skeletal muscle. So I, and I've talked to Chris about this, I was like, I really, going hard on DHA is something that you might want to consider in the future just because it's, you know, it's, it seems as though the importance of the, you know, preventing the disuse atrophy by, via sensitizing skeletal muscle to amino acids from whatever way it's doing it. Chris thinks mitochondrial ways and possibly transport, it's not known, um, that, that basically, uh, you know, getting, getting that high dose. And again, it needs to, it takes about four weeks for the DHA to accumulate in the skeletal muscle. So it's not, it's not like the anti-inflammatory effect of omega-3, which is like instant, right? So it's a little bit different. The yeah, question is fine. Um, I took away here, do you like a lot of your research is like more is better. And I understand that there's also some research around um, cardiovascular injury from like endurance athletes and intense, intense sport. I'm just curious if you have seen any of that or, or offer any kind of cautionary around around those kinds of conclusions? That's a great question. Um, and I'm going to defer to some of the experts on that, where like Dr. Ben Levine, um, I think he, as far as I've, I've heard from him is yes, like when you get to this like elite, elite athlete, endurance athlete level, I mean, there is some of the increased risks to, to do with like coronary calcification, whatever the, you know, the increased risks of that outcome are are actually even lower, even if the card- coronary al- calcification is a little bit higher. Do you know what I mean? So it's like their, cardi- their risk of cardiovascular death is still lower um, than people are normal, like, you know, committed exercisers. So, uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd say that's, that's not my area of expertise, but that's kind of the takeaway that I've gotten so far from experts. We have one more, uh, I've had one more question. A question about the uh, finished saunas versus the infrared saunas. Um, is the mechanism that uh, they're providing benefit uh, just because of the, the temperature and the increased heart rate, um, is that what makes finish better than infrared? And then corollary to that, um, you mentioned like 174 degrees as being a temperature. Um, what if it's like 200 or 220? Does that make it better or worse? Or is 174 kind of a sweet spot? Those are great questions. All right, so um, to first address the the mechanisms and is is the beneficial effect of deliberate heat exposure that I've talked about today uh, due to the increased heart rate, and, you know, the, the the mimicking of I would say moderate intensity exercise. I think a lot of it comes down to that the the improvements in cardio and respiratory fitness and cardiovascular improvements. Um, also, the heat shock proteins as well. So um, the heat shock proteins are playing a role in the muscle. They're playing a role in the immune system, and they're also playing a role in the brain. So people that use Finnish saunas four to seven times a week at those temperature, you know, parameters that I mentioned have about a 66% reduction in dementia risk, um, Alzheimer's disease risk. So yeah, I do think there is, it really does come down to elevating the core body temperature and getting that heart rate up and, and, and being, being physically uncomfortable like you are when you're exercising. Um, infrared saunas do work a little bit different. They're, they're moving molecules in your body and uh, heating you up a different way. There is evidence coming out of Dr. Ashley Mason's lab at UCSF, um, who I've been collaborating with, showing that a very rigorous infrared sauna protocol, it's like a heat bed where you're head out. And these people are, they're, they're used, it's using infrared um, you know, heat to, into a feverish state. So they're getting to like 101.3 Fahrenheit. They're getting a fever. Like, so it, it, it's getting them hot. Um, but they're in there for like, you know, in some cases over an hour, 
50 minutes over an hour. And it's a very intense protocol that most people doing infrared sauna aren't doing. So I do think there is a role for infrared sauna, but again, it's like you just like getting, getting to that point where you're getting the heart rate up and getting all those, those benefits, it takes a lot longer. Um, and then the other question is, well, what about is more better? Um, so here, here, I'll give you my take, then I'll tell you about one study. Um, I think that when it comes to the, the we're stressing our body, um, and this kind of goes back to the, this, this lady's question as well. I mean, heat stress is a stress, right? I mean, hyperthermia is a real thing. Like you can get damage from too much heat. So um, it's important to keep in mind that there's always like a window of you're, you're, you're engaging in this, this kind of stressful activity, like physical activity or deliber deliberate heat exposure to have this, uh, you know, response. Um, it's, it's an adaptation, it's, some people call it a hormetic response um, to you know, have the anti-inflammatory benefits, the antioxidant benefits, all the adaptations that happen. But when you make that stress too high, then it's hard to counter that stress with our adaptations, right? So um, when you're going in a 200 degree Fahrenheit sauna or 215 or whatever, it is very hot. And there are studies, animal studies and stuff like, when you get too hot, you can actually permeabilize the, bl the blood brain barrier. Um, and so I know it's like, there's this go hard, there's always this push like, and if you're that kind of person, you're like, well, I give it my all. Um, there's, there's one study, this was not out of Yar Dr. Yari Lakunin's lab, it was another study. I can't remember if it was Poland, uh, might've still been Finland, it was Finland or Poland. But um, they were looking at a variety of temperatures and dementia risk and Alzheimer's disease risk um, in people that use the sauna. And it, was, it repeated what Dr. Lapkin had found. So people that use the sauna frequently uh, had a much lower risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But only if they weren't getting in a, a sauna that was over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If they were getting in a sauna that was over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, they were actually having the opposite effect. And I don't talk about that a lot because it's not really understood why and I don't want to like people to get scared but I do think it kind of highlights the role of like why do you need to go in a 215 degree like have you it, it's, it's it's so hot you know and your, your brain is in there like so I I don't think that going in a 200 degree Fahrenheit sauna is the way you have to do it I think you can get in 180 185 if you really want to go 190 yeah like but maybe stop <laughs> before it gets to 200 degree Fahrenheit so Well, yeah, so the question is, was, is 174 degree Fahrenheit the sweet spot? That is the average temperature that people in those studies were using. And um, I, I typically do around 175, 180, and I do, I do put water on the rocks to make steam, which makes it hotter. And I usually do it after workout. So I'm already hot. I'm already, I already have my, my heart rate elevated. So um, yeah, I mean, doing, doing 30 minutes at 175 degrees Fahrenheit is nice. I think it's safer for the brain. I think, I mean, you're getting a lot of the benefits. Studies have shown that 30 minutes at 163 degrees Fahrenheit increases heat shock proteins by 50% over baseline. So I don't know that you have to go to 200 degrees and I don't know that you should, um, to be honest. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>